in fact, use that to give you a creation theory. If one goes back in time, one comes to the Big Bang singularity, where the laws of physics break down. But there's another direction of time that one can go in, which avoids the singularity. This is called the imaginary direction of time. In imaginary time, there need not be any singularities which form a beginning or end to time. When you come to imaginary time, you have this rather peculiar possibility of having a now, as it were, without necessarily having a, a sort of chain of, 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 of past moments. Um, if uh, we start where we are at the moment, start running backwards in time, as it were, then for a long time it, things work perfectly normally. But then as you begin to get further and further back towards what would be the origin point in the conventional real-time picture, you find that the nature of the time changes, that the imaginary component becomes more and more prominent. And in the end, what ought to have been the singular point in the classical theory just gets smoothed away, and you have this sort of beautiful picture, these sort of bowls, uh, where the creation of the universe is pictured as uh, where we are now, in a smooth sort of bowl of the past, where there's no initial point, just a sort of smooth shape. So long as the universe had a beginning, we could suppose it had a creator. But if the universe is completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, it would neither be created nor destroyed. It would simply be. What place, then, for a creator? What we could really say is that the universe is, because it's a self-consistent mathematical structure. There's no past, because unlike the creation of the point scenario, there's nothing for it to be created in, you see. So to say it's created from nothing is actually a little bit of a misnomer. It's, it's, mis it's a misleading use of the word nothing. It's not just that there was empty space in which the universe appeared, which you might call nothing. There was really nothing at all, because there wasn't even a creation event. You see, the, the use of a past tense in a verb becomes inappropriate in these theories. Unfortunately, tenses were set up and people believed in real time, of course. <laughs> and we don't yet have a linguistic uh, form to describe tenses in imaginary time. The word time was not handed down from heaven as a gift from on high. The idea of time is a word invented by man. And if it has puzzlements connected with it, whose fault is it? It's our fault. Where does the difference between the past and the future come from? The laws of science do not distinguish between the past and the future. Yet, there is a big difference between the past and future in ordinary life. You may see a cup of tea fall off a table and break into pieces on the floor, but you will never see the cup gather itself back together and jump back on the table. The increase of disorder, or entropy, is what distinguishes the past from the future, giving a direction to time. He fell ill in Switzerland. When he came back, he was on a ventilator. Because he's on a ventilator, you've got a tube down your throat and therefore you can't speak, just for that reason. For that period, which may have been a couple of months, I spent probably one in two nights, one in three nights at the hospital. Because when he was in hospital, um, he couldn't communicate with the nurses. And it's not just like being seriously ill, but you're in a position where the nurses couldn't understand what Stephen wanted. If Stephen was uncomfortable, they couldn't tell why. Before I caught pneumonia, my speech had been getting more slurred, so that only a few people who knew me well could understand me. But at least I could communicate. I wrote scientific papers by dictating to a secretary, and I gave seminars through an interpreter. And then, a tracheostomy operation 
removed my ability to speak altogether. After a long time, well, it seemed like a long time, somebody came up with this brilliant gadget. They didn't have it at the Cambridge Hospital. They got it from somewhere in London. This was high technology, how you can communicate with a person with no voice. It's a plastic um, piece of perspex about so big, and you've got the letters of the alphabet arranged like that in a hole in the middle. And you hold it up between you and the other person, and they look at a letter, and you can see, of course, which letter they're looking at most of the time. Sometimes you can't quite be sure. And so you would get the patient to spell out what they wanted. You know, so each letter, they have to look to pick out the A. And you say, A, you get it right. <laughs> it's like a guessing game. Stephen wasn't willing to accept that he wasn't going to speak again. And he thought that he would be giving in by trying to find a method of communicating other than speech. And I remember I went in one evening, um, and this was the first time that he asked to be gotten out of bed to use the computer. Sometimes they would sit him up so that he wasn't lying in the bed all the time, as you do with a patient. But this time when I turned up, he asked the nurse, could he be gotten out of bed? Um, so he could use the computer, and he did. And I remember the first thing he typed on there after saying hello, Stephen's always very polite about things like that, um, was, will you help me finish my book? A computer expert in California heard of my plight and sent me a computer program called Equalizer. <laughs> 